We'll Better see. without my cap, probably. No, you can have it on if you want. Whatever. It's uh, a little chilly in here. My like curl. I had my curls cut off, so it wasn't so warm. You know. <laughs> well, if if you want it on, you can have it on. If you want it off, you can have it off. As long as it's not giving you a shadow for the camera. No, I could use his face as clear. Okay. Okay, so I'll introduce myself first, then you introduce yourself. Tell okay. what unit you were with. Okay. Okay, Here. so. This will help. Got to look like a traveling billboard. <laughs> well, that, that'll identify you. That's his actual shoulder patch in the army. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Viking ship. All right. The men with the ship on their shoulder. That's what that meant. Okay. Yeah, we I had, didn't understand that. That was, that was our shoulder patch, so we had a big write-up in the Sun Sonora magazine, and they, he wrote that these were the men with the ship on their shoulder. Okay. <laughs> now I've got it. All right. My name is Vicki Johnson. I'm at the Denver uh, reunion of the 10th Mountain Division. It's August 5th. 2007, and I'm interviewing Harold K. Hansen of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And what unit were you in, Harold? I was in Company A of the 99th Norwegian American Battalion, uh, Infantry Battalion, and uh, we came to Camp Hale in December of 1942 when they were just finishing up the barracks over there. I, we saw carpenters running around when we moved in. and. Uh, we stayed there until the middle of August when we left Camp Hale to uh, go overseas. So you were recruited into the 10th Mountain Division? We were training at the same time that they were at, and we were under the general out there. He was control over the whole camp, you know, so we were under the general. But we were also designated as the 99th Infantry Battalion separate, and we remained that throughout the war. Could you explain that to me? Well, uh, we trained as a special unit. You had to speak and understand Norwegian, and they preferred, preferably, you were born in Norway and grew up there, so you were well acquainted with the language and you spoke the dialects that was n natural to the area. I, growing up in the United States with Scandinavian parents, had a different slant on, on the language, and so we could be the Gestapo or the Nazis would immediately recognize that, hey, they're not, they're not local people, they're somebody else, and so you were under surveillance immediately or, or arrested and hauled away. So uh, they were wanted, when we were stationed at Camp Hale, we had officers from Norway and the United States come and interviewed the men, and they were looking for men to go into special training to invade Norway and do demolition and uh, and uh, ex demolition and uh, other things to slow up the Germans and and uh, help win the war. And uh, we, uh, as the time went by, we were on our training, we, when we left Camp Hale. We went, uh, left from Camp Shanks, New York, and we landed in Scotland in, uh, in September of 40, 1943. And immediately, we were, we were retained the, the 99th Infantry Battalion separate, but the Norwegian American Battalion drew interest from the Germans, of course, Norwegian American. And so they were keeping a close eye on us, and as we were in Great Britain, we, we kept moving back and forth from England to Scotland to Wales, back to Scotland, back to England, and so on and so forth. And as we did this, German troops also moved corresponding to the moves we made, so they were expecting, hey, you're moving, they're moving down here. As we were, as we were planning for an invasion, they were going to be in that area, and we, at the same time that we were there, they had Patton's, the, the story, they let out the story of General Patton having a tank corps up there that was going to invade, and they had these silhouette tanks out there that looked like 
axle from the air, they look like tanks, but so a lot of times there was stuff in balloons or just, just a, like a billboard or something like that. So uh, we, uh, I think we got the 99th designation, 99th Infantry Battalion separate, separate, never a part of another unit. We could be attached to them, but we were never a part of that unit. They kept us separate. So you were attached to the 10th for training? For yes, we attached. We were under the control of the General of the 10th of uh, Camp Hale to the 10th Mountain while we were stationed there. But we trained separately from, they were training in their areas and we trained, we never went together on training objects or objectives and that, but uh, they in turn had control of the mules and the dogs and that out there. We had nothing like that and I always enjoy telling people they, when they ask, did you have mules and dogs and that? And I said, no, our, our battalion commander said he had Norwegians to do all that work. <laughs> so, uh, but anyhow, we, uh, we stayed in, uh, in Great Britain until the invasion at Normandy. And we had, we had transferred back and forth in, like I said, in, in uh, Great Britain. And so we, I think in about D-Day plus five, we were put on the ship to go to Normandy Beachhead, to Omaha Beach. But we got caught in a storm out there, and the, f the first group of our men from our battalion landed before the storm closed off the landings. And, uh, and our motor pool uh, officer is here at the, at the convention now, a reunion, and he said he got in without even wetting his shoes. Well, when we came after the storm and came in, we were dropped off, I don't know how many yards from the shore, but we were West de waist deep in water, and this one guy said, well, you're lucky you were tall. He said, I had water up to my ears because <laughs> he was short. But we, we went in, but we didn't fight on the, on the shore because they advanced in uh, far enough, so we just formed into our unit and marched up the hill, and as we're going up the hill off from the beach, we met trucks, American trucks, coming and we got the orders to, nobody look back, everybody keep your eyes forward. And so uh, I thought, well, I could be killed at any minute, I'm going to see what I'm not supposed to see. So I looked back, and in the back of all those trucks was just bodies of American soldiers bouncing like cordwood. They just tossed them in there one on top of the other and hauling them off to, to the graves registration, I suppose, but, uh, and burial. So I saw that. and. Uh, Anyhow, we, we continued on, and we followed the 4th Division, which was the divis division I left to go to the Norwegian Battalion. They were on, on the initial landing and suffered great casualty law, loss, and so we followed them into Cherbourg, and we moved into a, we were designated to occupy a building there it was a school of some sort. I don't remember anymore what the school was, but we moved into this building, and while we moved in there, the Germans were there, and they just prepared their breakfast, hot breakfast, and uh, our guards moved them, took them out and moved them on down to the holding center for the prisoners, and some of our guys said, well, they can't let this breakfast go to waste. So they sat down to eat, and I said, I'm not going to eat it. I don't know what they put in there when they knew we were coming, you know. They may have done a little preparation for us, so I said, but the guys that ate it got by fine, so. But I said I wasn't willing to take that chance. But we... Uh, so what did you do when you were in Cherbourg? What was your responsibility? W there was to help clear out, which we did all the way through till the breakout of St. Lo. We kind of followed in the footsteps of Pat, and we wiped it. He wanted to move so fast, and we followed and wiped out all the spots that, he, uh, groups that he bypassed. You know, there was pockets of German resistance here and there all along, and so we'd have to go in and take care of all those pockets of resistance. So I understand that you were guarding a German supply depot. Uh, yes, this was a big surprise, too. I said... Uh, they had monstrous caves into the hills there, 
and store storage of all kinds of things. One of the, one area they had hogs that were as big as anything we had ever seen that they hadn't didn't have time to butcher. So they, uh, the hogs are still running around there alive. Other section was full of liquor. And I said, you can't do better than that. Be a Scandinavian, get in charge of a liquor supply to guard it. You know, that's like putting the cat to charge the cr in charge of s guarding the cream, you know, because Scandinavians are noted for their drinking ability. But anyhow, there was all types of supplies there. and. And the men that got, got duty of guarding this liquor supply said that's the best duty they ever had in the Army. Because when they'd leave at night and get exchange guard groups, they'd take a case or two of the liquor with them. They'd, they'd pull it out from, they'd move out car on the side and pull one out from the inner pile, inner side of the pile, and then shove an empty one in there to place it and then put the full ones in front again. So by the time they signed this over to a British officer, and had him sign for it. He didn't take time to investigate, so I wonder what he thought when he got them outside full crate. Cases of liquor taken away and found nothing but empty ones inside there. He was probably a little bit surprised and disappointed with what he had signed, you know. But uh, there was uh, a short while where there was liquor supply divided amongst the troops, but that ended quite quickly because it, it don't work good with, I don't think anyhow, I don't know what the top brass thought about it, but some guys don't handle their liquor at all and others can consume quite a bit and not be affected. So you don't know who gets it and what effect it'll have. So that was cut off. All right, so after Cherbourg, where did you go? We continued on mopping up resistance pockets that had been bypassed till uh, uh, the breakout of, the, of at St. Lo, and the breakout of St. Lo, just prior to the breakout of St. Lo, I was, although I worked in battalion headquarters, I pulled guard duty like anybody else, and I was, uh, I was uh, assigned to guard duty with a friend of mine, and as we were out there at night, there explosions going on all around us, and the ground shaking and that, and this friend of mine says, we got to get out of here. He said, we can't do anything against this. And I said, you can't, if once you've been posted as a guard, you can't leave until you've been properly relieved. You can't leave your post or you can be court-martialed. And he says, watch me. And he disappeared and I didn't see him till the next day. But when I was relieved, I didn't want to turn him in to be court-martialed and busted because he was a corporal. So I said, uh, he had to go to the toilet. <laughs> so. They just let it slide and never questioned me further. So, but anyhow, in the next day or two, we broke out of the uh, the, uh, the the uh, beachhead. Anyhow, and uh, and the beachhead was something I'm I'm really amazed that that wasn't told to us what we were going to. There was hedgerows, you know. It didn't, Maybe, maybe some was as much as like a football field apart. But you break through one, and there's another one. And the machine gun and German guns were set up in that one, waiting for you. And you had to get if our tanks tried to go over a uh, one of these hedgerows, the dirt had over the years had piled up. So oh, I don't know what, probably four or five feet or whatever probably around four feet, but the tank would come and he'd go up like that and expose the belly of the tank and the Germans would knock it out with one blow. So there's this farm boy, I don't remember which outfit, he wasn't in our outfit, but he said, you get me a welding unit, a welding torch and some metal and I'll fix up something we can get through these hedgerows real easy. So he fixed up some sort of a deal like a, like a big fork, you know, and he could just go into the bottom part of the hedgerow and just clear the place and he'd go through and infantry could follow along and other and because once you get through one hedgerow there was guns phasing at you from the next one so the faster you could move through there the better off you were so that's what we fought and I they must have had pictures of that prior to our going into Nor to Normandy but we never knew anything about it but that was it was at Normandy one week before the breakout 
when General Bradley in his A Soldier's Story autobiography telling the story of the, his uh, participation in the war told that they had a meeting of all the generals asking for more troops for the breakout and can do you remember what the quote was from the well they were asking for reinforcements because they had casualties prior to this and they wanted reinforcements and everybody was asking and so finally i don't remember the names anymore but this one general said well and he said i need another division so he well they didn't know if they could spare it but they finally signed the last division they had in reserve and then he said, now we got everything, you've got everything, he said, now you've got everything but my pistol. And the one general held his hands out ready to receive the pistol that I just had. And, but then he, he said, now the only thing we've got left in reserve of the whole United States First Army is a Norwegian American battalion. That's 1,000 men. And one. Now then just... <laughs> But he didn't follow up there on the charge. So, uh, but then after we got through the, the breakout of St. Lowe, things went pretty fast. We followed, well, we went into, uh, we got across ways into France and we went into the Netherlands on a canal drive. That was with the 2nd Armored Division. 2nd Armored Division and the 2nd Armored Division. Like uh, it's always been told, and, and it's certainly true, that infantry needs the tanks, and the tanks need the infantry. You've got to work together to succeed. And so uh, when we got into the canal drive and driving, uh, one tank commander was overheard to say, this is the only infantry outfit that I've seen that we have trouble keeping up with. That was due to all the heavy training and the fast moving you could do from having trained in the Rockies? Well, I suppose you were in top condition because even, even when we uh, were in Great Britain, we spent a lot of time, like I said, in Wales because there's, the terrain there is quite rugged and we spent a lot of time yet climbing hills and, uh, and carrying on as normally as we could in our regular training. But uh, we went into the Netherlands. We uh, we lost quite a few. We've, we've also have a monument up there with all the the uh, casualties of uh, the units that participated in the drive up there. And for our small unit, our casualty rate was quite high in comparison to a. We well, have to go to a regiment at least to get a yeah. percentage comparison. The information on the monument says that the 99th lost 11 killed in action, and the only unit that lost more than that was an entire regiment that lost 13. Otherwise, you got to uh, units bigger than, than even a regiment, and they were losing six or seven. So, But... Uh we got replacements for uh, pretty regular for our casualties that were had to be well either killed or had to be entered into a hospital. So that's when we started losing our complete Norwegian membership. And uh, just a couple of days before I came out here, I got a call from an army buddy in Pennsylvania who joined us. His name was Natali Di Pietro Paolo. And uh, not a bit Norwegian, but he loved the Norwegian battalion. And he said, and at uh, Reveille, at the roll call, our first sergeant had trouble pronouncing the last name. And so he spoke up one day and said, just call me Peter Olson. And from then on, he was Peter Olson. <laughs> and he called me, and uh, like I say, a couple of days before I left home to come out here, and he said, Harold? And I said, yes. And he says, this is Peter Olson. <laughs> and I knew right away who it was. We had another guy that was a replacement. His name was, people asked if we retained that Norwegian 
de demand for you had to know and uh, speak and understand Norwegian to get in. But we took whatever was available at the replacement depot, and one replacement was Jesus Angel Lopez, and and we had well we had a lot of replacements we needed, and they all worked out terrific. We didn't have a bad. Natali or Peter Olson was one of the Silver Star winners for the 99th, wasn't he? Yes. He, he won a Silver Star, and he was out there with his uh, friend uh, Svera Satri, who was really a Norwegian. And uh, they were pinned down by a German machine gun nest. And so they battled that for several minutes, back and forth, and and throwing hand grenades. And so finally they decided, well, the only way we're going to win this is to rush that machine gun nest. So they threw grenades, and at the same time they rushed out. He said, we were screaming like crazy Indians, he said. And he said, we wiped out that machine gun nest or killed several and the others surrendered. And then he said, one of the guys that surrendered was wearing American boots, army boots. And he said, I had never been issued boots. I still had the, the, the shoes and the, and the canvas leggings, he said. And so I had that guy sit down in the snow and take those boots off. And he said, they just fit me. And he said, I gave him my shoes and I kept his boots. <laughs> and he said, because he'd never been issued boots. So, so you, were in, let's, you were in the Netherlands. And then, and then what happened? Then we went back to Belgium again, back to Tilf, Belgium. And uh, then we had a brief entrance into, uh, into uh, Germany. But back out again, then we went down into uh, Luxembourg. And uh, well, it's hard to keep track of the exact movements we had all the time because I said I had that big map with me showing and reading it off there. But anyhow, we, uh, we went, went back to, uh, to Germany. We Your went to Aachen. Was at Aachen, wasn't it? Yeah, and actually, it was Aachen, Germany. German, the, uh, Aachen had been completely surrounded except one escape route that the Norwegian army had kept open. German and they, army kept it open. And and they uh, they had uh, high ground on both sides of this valley where this escape route of theirs was, so they had it well covered with with artillery shelling. And so there was a division moving in from the right and from the left, and it was kind of stalemated there, so I guess they figured they had a, they could sacrifice a battalion, so they sent the Norwegian battalion into that space that was still open. So and, uh, those four special units behind First Army, you were one of them, and when they got the tough assignments, one of those four units would get that assignment to solve the problem. Yeah, well, I, I, ref, I always say, well, they say, what did you do? And I said, well, we were like the office boy. You had some errand you had to do or you, you had a town you had to capture. Go take that one. We'd go and take it as a battalion and a regiment or more would relieve us and we'd take off and go. This happened at, uh, at uh, El Buff in France where we had our first real bad loss in personnel. Our battalion commander was hit and they evacuated. And uh, the uh, we were replaced by Canadians there. We had captured the town of, of Elbeuf and the uh, Canadian unit came in and relieved us. And there again we were very fortunate because the next day after the Canadians relieved us and took over control the Germans mounted a severe counterattack, and the Canadians were overrun. And so if we'd have stayed on there, we certainly would have, because there was a regiment that moved in there and got overrun, and we were only a battalion, and so we wouldn't have stood a chance at all. So uh, I said we had many fortunate occurrences that we lost a lot of people, but we still would you like to tell the story of the favorite soldier in A Company that was lost, your first casualty? Well, we had the, um, 
we had a sergeant in weapons, and he, uh, his dad had a, a dance orchestra, a Norwegian American, a Norwegian accordion band that played for, for dances all the way through the Midwest. And he, his youngest son happened to get into this Norwegian battalion. He was a great accordion player, so whenever we were in rest area or that, he'd get his accordion out. And I don't know how he ever got it shipped along all the time, but he brought it along. And, uh, and so we had a small orchestra. We had a guy on uh, all different instruments. And so uh, we had these guys riding on the second infantry or second armored infantry or armored di division I should say Those second guys, armored division they ride wheels? they ride on there for supporting the tank and the tank supporting them and so they'd ri ridden for some time there and so the two of these guys from same company same same, same platoon said well hey Let's, let's change sides so we get, you know, as we go along, we can uh, look at things from, an op uh, from another direction. And so they switched sides, and they hadn't gone very far till a, ri a bullet ricocheted, a German bullet ricocheted off the tank and caught Osmond Scarning right in the stomach, and, just, and he just dropped off the tank, and when he dropped off the tank, his intestines ever just dropped out, and he was killed instantly. All he said was, well, there was another Harold Hansen in the company, and he, I had a middle initial K, so I was HK. He was just NMI, you know, no HNMI, no middle initial, because there was so many Hansons. And anyhow, he jumped down to help him, and he said, they got me, Hansen. That's the end of him. And uh, it's hard to lose any of one. But uh, I said, this, this is the first reunion we've met with the Tenth Mountain. And I said, I've really enjoyed it. So many nice people. Let's back up a little bit. You were talking about being in Aachen. Yes. Uh, uh, years later in civilian life, I met a, an officer, uh, my dentist, one of the dentists I did work for because I was a dental technician, and I did work for this doctor and was talking about the war, and he said he was in the, in the Aachen area with an engineer battalion, and they were on the north side of Aachen, and he said they loaded a freight car full of explosives and released it to go down the hill into Aachen, and then they hit it with artillery and exploded the whole thing. You know, and, and uh, there again, Hitler had given advice that, that Aachen was going to, they should fight to the last man, you know, and this, this was normal for Hitler. He said if they, had to, if they had to retreat from Paris, burn Paris. And uh, there was a, uh, a Swedish, uh, uh, what would you call him, I don't know. Hmm? Diplomat. Diplomat, yeah, over there. And he, he visited with this general, and he said, you know, if you follow Hitler's orders and burn and kill these people as you retreat, he said, your name isn't going to be anything but a bad memory, and you'll have a bad name the rest of history. But he said, if you hold off on this burning and let the occupying troops come in here and save the city, he said, you'll be a hero. And this guy kept stalling. I read a book about that, history about it, how he kept stalling. Hitler would call and say, is it burning? And uh, he'd say, well, I, I got the, all, the, all the explosives set but in this one place, and we'll be all set for it. And, you know, and he kept on stalling. And finally, the, the uh, French, what they call it, the French Second Army or something, let them go in there first. And then the, American, the rest of the American troops followed in. And so, Paris was saved Going by back. this by this diplomat talking to this uh, German. Well, he had changed he had changed uh, commanding officers of the of the Soviet Union uh, forces. German occupying force. 
Yeah, yeah, they, he had he had changed commanders because the other one wasn't following orders good enough, and so he put a new one in there that he really trusted. And this guy listened to the Swedish diplomat more than he listened to his, Hitler. And so I said, there again, saved the lives of a lot of innocent people. Going back to the 99th story at, uh, at Aachen, what was the name of the little town where you blocked the escape oh, route and the resupply? Nine route? days of hell. Worsland. Worsland. And that was along the escape route going out of Aachen. And uh, there you couldn't, well, pin down in that area for nine days before it finally broke open. And uh, couldn't get food, you'd have to try to sneak food up there during the dark hours of the night, you know, and uh, we had one little guy, worked, Fritz Carlson, worked in the kitchen of headquarters, no, D Company, and uh, he was trying to get uh, f coffee. He was pulling these uh, heavy, uh, well, call them pots, coffee pots, but uh, they were, so he could, had covers on him, and he could crawl and crawl and pull those along. Well, one of them was hit, and he lost all the coffee out of the one, but he got the one through up there, and, and he can't imagine how he was managed to keep the other one from getting shot out away from him, or at least punctured to lose all the coffee. But, you know, they lived without, without water or drink and food for hours, you know, because they couldn't get anybody to him, but they'd try to get it at night. And they managed so well. We made it through there. And Didn't he tell the story at the reunion that from then on he never had to buy a drink when he went on? Oh yeah. The place, he <laughs> with the hot food and the hot drink. Yeah, he said the guys were so thankful for what he had been able to bring through the firing lines up to them. And but they all referred. We all knew that that time as the nine days in hell because we just. They're looking right down at us, you know, and you get in a foxhole and you could shoot right into your foxhole, so you were at the mercy of the Germans for sure for quite some time. Was that your scariest experience there? I think so, and I think most of the guys in the uh, in the battalion uh, would, uh, would agree that that was probably the toughest. There was other tough times, you know. They're, they're all tough, but... Uh, When you're when you're when you're living with the expectation that you could die at any second, why? So from Aachen, where did you go? Uh, it seems to me we went back to. Uh, well, I'd, yeah, I think we went back to the coast of France after that. I should have taken notes. And, what, wasn't that when you went to Till? North well, of where the bulge well we went to Tilt, but we went, then we went back to the coast of France again to, let, let me straighten out in my mind how these things really happen now. The, uh, uh, I was wondering if that's when we went back and became. No, no, that, that was later after the bulge, Dad. So th this was but, oh yeah, then we were we were we were back to Tilf. That's just uh, that's just outside of Liège, and Liège is a large rail center there, and very important to to us and also to the Germans. So we were holding on to it, and he was, and this is at the time when when Germany uh, Hitler and his bombs started. You know the buzz bomb, you know the. The uh, civilians would holler. Well, you could hear it coming. The first bombs—they were just a noisy thing coming through the through the uh, sky, and uh, you hear it like an old tractor or something. And all of a sudden, it'd shut off, and then it'd start up again. And and then when it started stuttering like that, you knew it was coming down. So you had warning, and the people, the civilians, would all holler, "Robo, robo!" And they'd drop in the, along the curb in the streets or along the house or dash for. Uh, a bomb shelter, but then when he got the the V2 bomb, that was faster than sound, so that would hit before you knew it was coming, you know. 
and uh, you had very little protection from that. And he rained those onto Liege because he insisted on knocking that out because of it was so important to the Allies. And uh, there again, he had he had let up on his bombing with the with the V1 bomb or V2 bombs because he thought he had it. But then activity continued on there afterwards, just so he had to start up again. And uh, I think about, we were pulled back to an area for a rest area and we marched for, I don't know, maybe a mile or so to a building where we could watch a movie. And uh, this noisy buzz bomb came over and we were wondering where in the world it's gonna hit and it hit right beyond where we were walking. But we could kind of judge by, by the sound, you know, but when he changed to the silent one or the one faster than sound, it was, more dangerous, but uh, when we moved away from Tilf to uh, to the uh, to the Battle of the Bulge, be we left there because we got word that we had there was a disturbance over by Malmedy, and we had to go there and and help take care of it and uh, don't bother to pack, we'll only be gone for probably a couple of days. Well, a couple of days turned out to be 31 days. And uh, didn't have shaving equipment or <laughs> change of clothing or, or anything, so 31 days was made a, in the 31 days after that passed, it was a grubby looking bunch of soldiers. But uh, the, uh, There again, we were on the north end of, of the, the breakthrough, protecting Malmody. So that was the northern shoulder of the bulge? Yeah, of the bulge, and there was, in direct line from their breakthrough in the Ardennes, they were heading for the First Army headquarters at Spa, which was south of Liège, and then they could go on west to Antwerp, the coast that they wanted to reoccupy because it was fully in our hands at this time. And if they could destroy that, if they could accomplish what they had in mind, they were gonna separate the, you know, the Allied forces and then we would probably s sign a truce and Hitler could stay in power and we could go home or whatever, what he didn't mind. But uh, we were able to stop him. We, we moved into uh, to, uh, Malmody and we set up our defense along the, well, there was only an engineer unit there with 52 men, I think, in that area to try to hold it. So they were putting out roadblocks and explosives and that. But they knew if the charge came through there, they were going to last for just a short time. And so there was little units coming in from different places. So uh, Colonel... Uh, hmm. Peregrine. Peregrine of the engineers, he he phoned into the uh, higher ranking officers and wherever, first probably Army the first headquarters. army headquarters, and said, "We can we can stall them, but we can't hold. You know, we need help." And he said, "The happiest day in his life was when he saw the Norwegian American battalion <laughs> come marching in, and uh, so we got in and we set up." It was turned over to uh, our Colonel Hansen to set up a defense there, and he set up a defensive line along a railroad embankment. This is a railroad embankment. It was about, I would guess, maybe about 16 feet high because you had drive-through areas, you know, for big trucks to go to if they needed. And that's where we set up our anti or our, our anti-tank guns from this company that came in to reinforce us, and. Uh, the Germans had to come, we were up there on this high embankment and railroad tracks in front of us, so we had pretty good, pretty good defense. And they had to come across an open area behind and much lower, you know, coming here. And they had, in this open area, they come rushing and hollering, you know, good English, surrender or die, surrender or die. And they came right to the base of this embankment still hollering, surrender or die, and just walking over their own dead comrades and that, and their, their, 
their uh, art uh, their vehicles and that were being blown up their tanks were set on fire and one of our guys said he uh, his name was um, Johansson yeah uh, down in Florida Ra uh, what Burger Johansson Johansson Burger Johansson he was he was born in Sweden, but he got into the Norwegian battalion. And he said, I knocked out two of those tanks. <laughs> and he came last year to our reunion, but he couldn't make it this year. But uh, finally they gave up. Had to walk over their own dead again to get out of there and leave their, all their equipment and everything and just rushed and took off to get out of there. So our defense held. And uh, Melody put up a monument there in memory and honoring our battalion, and they renamed the avenue going by in that area, Avenue de Norwegian. What were you doing the day before the bulge? Oh, I was safe. I had to take the payroll, and uh, because we, it always had this, get the payroll done so we, we uh, can keep the morale high. And uh, so I got a Jeep driver and the payroll and took off to, and I, we had our, our company, the company that I was taking care of company with the records eight. and the payroll, I had to go and, and get the signature for every man if he's going to get paid. So we were busted up guarding Brick factory, sawmill, you name it, and crossroads, blockade, and, uh, guard, you know, or whatever. And uh, I said, I just regret that I didn't keep that map that I had because I went all over that place, all the way from 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 up there by Tilf down to about three miles north of of Bastogne, where. A horrible fighting took place just, uh, well, hours, day, a few days, a couple, three days. And uh, I said, I traveled that whole area, got the men to sign, and and uh, they got paid when payday came along. But I said, wow, if I had been a couple days later or just on a, just a day later, I, I could have been way down in that area close to Bastogne and... I and a Jeep driver would have been casualties for sure. But uh, talking about the payroll, when that was that was a thing that always come up. You know, we got to keep the morale high. We got to keep the morale high. So we get. So this was when we were stationed there at Tilf, and uh, I got to sleep in a farmer's barn. But over there, the the buildings are the house, the barn, and and in between there's storage places for the fruit and potatoes and whatnot, you know. And so he said, you can sleep in the barn above the, the cattle, but please don't smoke in the barn. And we said, don't worry, we won't smoke. I don't smoke anyhow. And uh, so he said, then, then he said, uh, don't use the barn as a toilet. So we promised that too, and we slept out, and we slept in the barn, and had our toilet outside, and uh, but uh, we set up our, we, I don't know where we got the candles. I've thought about that many times. How did we get candles? We lit the candles and dripped wax on one side of the typewriter and then dripped wax on the other side of the candle there so we could see the typewriter and then warm our hands over that because we were in a machine shed that's close in the back, but the roof comes over and then it's all open in the front here. You just put your machine in the shelter. And we were in there, and the little boy came out. I suppose he was probably four to five years old. And he says, Mama Haga, Mama Haga, suck the who's home and scribing? And we understood that. <laughs> Mama has said to come in the house and write. And so we gathered up our typewriters, and she stood at the door and held it open, and then she led us into her dining room, and we set our typewriters around the table on, in the dining room, and nice and warm and comfortable and she asked us if we wanted some warm milk they had dairy cows so they had plenty of milk and she heated up milk for and give us warm milk to drink and i said what beautiful people we have just a few minutes left okay so i'd like you to tell me the story about the gold bars and the other gold things 
and the connection with the oh, Friday night. Yeah, uh, it wasn't our men, but it was men on guard. And uh, and uh, they they stopped a lady or two ladies coming and wanted to go through, and they said, you can't go through here. And they said, well, they were midwife and a nurse or whatever and going to help a lady who was having a baby. And they said, no, nah, well, you got to go around. Well, they finally went and asked the, their commanding officer, and they said, well, two, you got, two of you go with so you make sure that they're going not for anything else than what they said, you know. So they took it to this house and found out that they were actually going to be helping this lady that was in labor. And she, as they marched by, the, marched by this place, she said, there's where the Germans keep all the treasures that they, that they confiscate and uh, or accumulate. So they went back and they told their commanding officer, and so he passed it on, and so they investigated, and this was the Merkur salt mines, and it was just filled with art traceries, gold, Thought to how many pounds did they say? See, they they had a deal when they took prisoners, civilian or, or otherwise, if they had gold teeth, they'd knock them out, take the gold, and they had just pounds, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of gold from gold fillings and gold teeth, you know. And, and uh, then in there they had all kinds of beautiful, valuable art. And our unit was selected to haul that from the salt mines to Frankfurt Bank. And uh, we had two days, we had a convoy two days, and he had, uh, what was, how many trucks did we have in there? And between each truck we had a, we had a personnel carrier with a, with a squad of uh, riflemen. We had uh, P-51, no, P-47 fighter planes circling up above the convoy. And, uh, and closer by, we had Cubs, Cubs planes, Piper Cubs planes, and they were in radio contact with the, with the fighter planes up above, so they were protecting in case anything happened down there. Well, uh, it so happened one of the vehicles had a flat tire, and they stopped, and so that stopped. This was on the, on the Autobahn and where they can drive any speed that their vehicle is able to accomplish. So everything had to stop. Nobody could go by us. And so there was a, uh, I forget, a major or a captain of... Uh, it was a major. And he, he ca caught up to us and had to stop. You know, the guard stopped him. And so he said, uh, he wanted to talk to who was in charge of this, who who stopped them, the traffic on the Autobahn. They, he said, I want to talk to him. They said, well, we'll bring him down here. So he come down here as this lieutenant comes up to this major. And the major says, what authority have you, have you got to stop traffic on the Autobahn? Pulled out the order, and it was General George Patton. <laughs> he gives the order, and he says, oh, OK. <laughs> He's satisfied to stay back there. But we ran that convoy two days in a row, hauling tracers out of that salt, Merker salt mines into the Frankfurt Bank. And I said, uh, and the gold was worth two point uh, one billion dollars. Is that right? Yeah, at that time. Now it's, you, it's anybody's guess what it'd be worth in these days, you know. So. Did the Norwegian American Battalion ever go to Norway? We went to Norway when we were with uh, General George Patton's Third Army tank following with them way down by Regensburg, Germany, when the war ended. Then we were immediately sent back to La Havre, France. We got our new Eisenhower jackets, got new clothing, and got on LSTs and took off for, for uh, Norway. They gave us the order, hey, we're going to Norway, and everybody was ready to go, because that's what we intended in the beginning. So we left, we left La Havre, we went across the channel, followed the British coastline till we got to the southern tip of Norway. We went across, then up to Oslo Fjord and landed at Oslo. And we were behind minesweepers because that water was mined by both the Allies and the, and the Germans. 
And so we had minesweepers in front of us all the way, and that's the roughest water in the world. That's what the story goes. But we were fortunate enough to have beautiful, calm weather. A little bit of rain, drizzle, but nothing that caused any complaints or what we called in the Army, bitching. <laughs> you know? And uh, we got to Norway, and I, I always like to tell about this guy coming into headquarters. We'd been there two hours. Well, when we got there, we started to get off the ship, and then we got word we had to stay on because the, uh, the German-built camp that we were going to move into was still occupied by the Germans, so we had to stay on ship one more night. And uh, two hours after we landed, the guy came in, one of our soldiers came in, and he wanted permission to go and get married. We thought, wow, that's a fast romance, you know. <laughs> it turned out that he was a seaman. When he left home four or five years ago, in 1940, before 1940, invasion, that was on the 7th of June, 1940, he had left home, and, he, and when he was going to return in two or three months, and when he returned, they were going to get married. Well, he didn't dare to go back because that was occupied by the Germans, and now we got another guy that reported the same thing. He had been gone since 1939, since he had been home, and he was going to marry when he come back, and so we had a lot of happy guys. It turned out that about 70 guys out of our battalion married Norwegian girls or ladies, and so. Well, I would love to hear more stories, but unfortunately. Yeah, time is time. Now because the next group will be coming. Yeah. <laughs> But we got out of the army on at Boston, Massachusetts. Took we left Norway, came home on the. Well, we had a storm every year. We were out going over and coming back, but we had a beautiful sailing days to go to Norway from France. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was record storms for you every trip. But you know, Except so many of so many of the guys in our battalion had families over there. So how long did you spend in Norway? Four and a half months. Oh. And there were over 400,000 German troops in Norway when we got there. And not a shot was fired. But we, with our small troops, if we had if we'd, uh, been unfortunate enough for them to try to hold out, you know, they were all armed. When they come out of their buildings that we surrounded in the mornings with bright lights, they come out, they threw their weapons all down on a pile. And they had us outnumbered, you know. We had a, probably 20 guys at the most out there circling the camp. And they come out of there probably oh, 200, between two and 300 people come out of the buildings, you know. And so, but what our duty was to take them back to the... Uh, Stay back, Dad. You, take them down to the oh, no, he's shipping lines and and ship them back to the country because they belong to 